One minute ago, sensors anchored miles offshore registered wave periods never before documented during routine storm activity. A coast preparing for typical winter weather now confronts something far more lethal. From California to Washington, swells are penetrating deeper inland than forecasters anticipated, shattering piers, obliterating beaches, and forcing thousands to evacuate. What makes these ocean pulses so different from ordinary tempests? Why are scientists monitoring them with unprecedented urgency? And what does this portend for millions residing along the Pacific Rim? The data is escalating by the hour. Offshore buoys monitor every approaching swell, measuring height, direction, and one critical parameter most people never consider – wave period. Right now, instruments are documenting dominant periods between 16 and 20 seconds, sustained for days. According to the National Data Buoy Center, these represent the longest period swells observed during a non-tropical storm event in modern records. Significant heights exceed 15 feet from Monterey Bay to Grays Harbor, Washington, but elevation alone doesn't reveal the full threat. Period is the time required for two consecutive crests to pass a fixed point. Short period motion, typically 4 to 11 seconds, originates from nearby wind fields. Long period swells, anything beyond 12 seconds, spawn in distant tempests and traverse thousands of miles across open ocean. The National Weather Service confirms these swells originated from massive low-pressure systems spinning across the North Pacific more than 2,000 miles offshore. These organized pulses carry exponentially more energy than chop wind-driven chop. At San Francisco's offshore buoy station, readings show peak periods holding at 18 seconds. Newport, Oregon reports similar conditions, 17-second periods, 16-foot faces. This uniformity across such vast distance reveals something ominous. The entire coastline is being hammered by the same energetic swell train. But why does periodicity hold such devastating significance? Energy content increases as the square of the period. A 15-foot swell arriving every 20 seconds delivers nearly six times the force of identical height arriving every eight seconds. The mathematics are unforgiving. Long period motion travels faster, maintains coherence across vast distances, and penetrates further into shallow zones before releasing accumulated energy. These swells arrive in organized sets, each pulse reinforcing the previous one, creating surges that obliterate natural buffers. When a 16-second train strikes a beach, water doesn't simply break and recede. It keeps advancing, scaling seawalls, flooding parking structures, sweeping across roads assumed safe. The physics transforms the ocean into a hydraulic battering ram. At 18-second periods, each wave stretches over 500 meters from crest to crest. This massive spacing means the wave base interacts with the seafloor at depths approaching 200 50 meters. As swells enter progressively shallower continental shelf waters, friction slows the bottom while the crest maintains velocity. The wave compresses vertically, steepens dramatically, and eventually collapses with explosive force. Unlike short-period chop that dissipates energy quickly, long-period swells retain momentum, driving water inland in what scientists term wave run-up. The transformation from harmless open ocean swell to lethal coastal weapon occurs in minutes. Emergency crews are executing closures at unprecedented scale. Lifeguard stations in Santa Cruz, Pacifica, and Half Moon Bay have barricaded jetties, promenades, and beach access points with physical barriers. Local authorities in Newport and Cannon Beach have shut parking facilities completely, deploying roadblocks on all approaches to the shoreline. Officials in Washington state have cordoned substantial portions of the Pacific Beach seawall after swells topped concrete barriers and submerged adjacent streets beneath two feet of churning seawater. The National Weather Service issued high surf warnings, spanning more than 1,000 miles of coastline, from Point Conception northward to the Canadian boundary. These measures reflect documented mortality. On December 23, 2024, a man at Sunset State Beach in Santa Cruz County became trapped beneath debris when a large wave struck without warning. Bystanders pulled him free, but he died hours later at a hospital. 
hospital. That same afternoon, another man disappeared into the surf at Marina State Beach, just miles away. Despite extensive air and sea searches by the U.S. Coast Guard and California Highway Patrol, his body was never recovered. Wave heights at the time exceeded 25 feet, with sets arriving every 18 to 20 seconds. First responders described conditions too dangerous to sustain rescue operations. These are not isolated incidents. The Pacific Ocean's Winter Tempest Factory operates thousands of miles offshore, where low-pressure systems measuring 960 millibars or lower generate sustained winds across enormous stretches of open water. Meteorologists call this expanse the fetch, and the relationship between fetch length and swell development is fundamental to understanding coastal hazards. When winds of 40 to 50 miles per hour blow across a fetch exceeding a thousand miles for 24 to 48 hours, chaotic surface chop transforms into coherent, powerful swells. The process resembles tuning discordant noise into a pure tone. The ocean functions as an energy reservoir, accumulating momentum from distant atmospheric violence and transmitting it toward continental margins days later. Satellite imagery from December 18 revealed three distinct low-pressure centers positioned across the North Pacific between 40 degrees north and 50 degrees north latitude. Each system generated its own wave field. As these fields propagated eastward at 35 miles per hour, they began to interact through constructive interference. The resulting swell achieved heights and periods greater than either source alone. This mechanism explains why buoy stations recorded 18-second periods despite individual storms generating only 14- to 16-second motion. The atmosphere conspired to create something more destructive than any single tempest could produce. But atmospheric conditions are generating something even more insidious. Multiple tempest systems have formed in rapid succession across the North Pacific Basin, each cyclone generates its own distinct swell train. When these trains overlap, energy accumulates rather than canceling out. Coastal zones receive no recovery interval between events. One 18-second swell arrives, penetrates 200 meters inland, and recedes. Before sand and gravel can resettle, before storm drains can evacuate accumulated water, the next train strikes, advancing 250 meters over already saturated ground. This stacking effect means beaches already weakened face repeated assaults with zero time to rebuild natural buffers. The shoreline is under siege, and each successive attack finds defenses weaker than before. Coastal geomorphologists describe this as a compound flooding event. The first swell removes protective sand from the beach face, lowering the protective berm. The second penetrates further with less resistance. The third reaches infrastructure that should have been safe. Beach profiles at Imperial Beach show sand elevation dropped 1.2 meters between December 20 and December 24. That vertical loss translates to roughly 12 meters of horizontal retreat. Structures that stood 30 meters from the waterline on December 19 sat barely 18 meters away by Christmas. What took decades to deposit is vanishing in days. When long-period swells transition from deep to shallow coastal waters, fluid dynamics transforms kinetic energy into vertical violence. As motion approaches shore, the seafloor exerts drag on the wave base while the crest maintains velocity. The swell compresses horizontally, steepens vertically, and eventually breaks. But long-period motion doesn't simply collapse once. It maintains momentum, driving water upslope in what scientists call run-up. Run-up is the vertical distance water travels above the normal high tide line. For a 16-second swell with 5-meter offshore height, run-up can exceed 10 meters on beaches with moderate slopes. Tidal state amplifies everything with brutal efficiency. When peak swells synchronize with high tide, water starts from an elevated baseline. 
Spring tides in December add 2 meters above mean sea level. A 5-meter swell with 10 meters of run-up launched from a 2-meter tide base means water reaches 17 meters above mean lower low water. Seawalls engineered for 12-meter events are overtopped by 5 meters. Parking structures become shallow lagoons. Roads transform into surging channels. The pier had stood for 68 years. It couldn't withstand 72 hours of 18-second swells. In Santa Cruz, catastrophic failure happened at 12.47 p.m. local time on December 23. Approximately 150 feet of the municipal wharf, a section under reconstruction following previous storm damage, separated from the main structure and collapsed into the Pacific. Three city employees conducting safety inspections plunged into 15 degrees Celsius water amidst swirling debris and pounding 7-meter breakers. Lifeguards stationed nearby on watercraft reached two victims within four minutes, the third self-rescued by clinging to floating debris. All three survived with minor injuries, but the wharf suffered catastrophic structural loss. Engineering assessments suggest repair costs will exceed $15 million. This was not random failure. It was physics overwhelming concrete and steel. West Cliff Drive in Santa Cruz remains barricaded after swells tore through metal guardrails weighing 200 kilograms each, depositing them 50 meters inland across the roadway. Sections of asphalt show undermining where water scoured sand and gravel from beneath the pavement. In Half Moon Bay, sandbags line beachfront properties three layers deep, yet sand itself erodes faster than crews can reinforce defenses. Oregon coastal towns like Depot Bay have closed jetty access after swells swept vehicles from parking areas, depositing them against seawalls 40 meters from their original positions. In Washington, the Gray's Harbor Bar entrance remains closed. Wave heights measured at the outer buoy exceeded 30 feet. Every section of coastline confronts its own version of catastrophe. Harbors present unique dangers during extended high surf events. Strong currents surge through narrow entrance channels at velocities approaching six knots. Floating docks strain against moorings as swells lift and drop them through vertical ranges exceeding three meters. On December 23rd, video from Santa Cruz Harbor captured a massive surge rolling through the marina, snapping two-inch diameter mooring lines and sending boats crashing into docks. Several vessels sustained hull breaches. Others broke free entirely, drifting into rocks where they capsized. The ocean is reclaiming territory it once dominated. Real-time monitoring systems operated by the National Data Buoy Center and NOAA provide the only advance warning. Offshore buoys equipped with accelerometers and GPS measure height, period, and direction every 30 minutes, transmitting data via satellite. The West Coast Network consists of 42 active stations. The National Weather Service integrates buoy data with atmospheric models and satellite imagery to predict when hazardous conditions will develop. Without this network, coastal communities would face each swell completely blind. Spectral analysis reveals energy concentrated in narrow bands between 0.05 and 0.06 hertz, corresponding to 16 to 20 second periods. This concentration indicates a single dominant source, the North Pacific Storm Cluster. But even perfect data cannot halt the ocean's advance. Social media flooded with videos labeled tsunami as swells crashed over seawalls. The confusion is understandable, but potentially lethal. Tsunamis are caused by sudden underwater disturbances, earthquakes measuring magnitude 7.0 or greater, submarine landslides, or volcanic eruptions. They generate motion with periods exceeding 10 minutes, traveling at velocities over 500 miles per hour in deep water. Storm-driven swells have periods measured in seconds. The Pacific Tusami Warning Center has issued zero tsunami alerts for the U.S. West Coast during this event. The distinction is critical for survival. Storm-driven motion builds gradually, arrives in predictable sets, and is tracked days in advance. 
Tsunamis strike with minimal warming and arrive as surges separated by minutes to hours. Authorities confirm every impact along the West Coast came from atmospheric storm systems, not tectonic activity. Misinformation propagates fastest when fear is already elevated. But make absolutely no mistake, storm-driven swells kill with horrifying efficiency. On December 23rd, swells at Santa Cruz reached heights of 60 feet, the force required to destroy 150 feet of reinforced concrete pier is measured in millions of pounds per square meter. Sneaker waves, larger than average pulses within a set, arrive without warning. They strike when people assume the pattern has stabilized, pulling victims into the surf in seconds. Distance from the water is the only reliable protection. Cold water shock causes involuntary gasping, often leading to aspiration. Disorientation follows within 30 seconds. Hypothermia reduces muscle function within 10 minutes. Of 47 ocean drownings along the California coast in 2023, 41 occurred during high surf conditions with periods exceeding 14 seconds. Respect translates directly to survival. The forecast offers zero relief. Additional storm systems are forming across the North Pacific. NAAA's latest projections show periods holding between 14 and 18 seconds through late December, with significant heights remaining above 12 feet. High surf warnings remain in effect from Point Conception to the Canadian boundary, covering approximately 1,200 miles. The ocean has not finished delivering its accumulated energy. This is not merely a winter storm. It is a glimpse of a coastal reality being rewritten. Research published in Nature Communications in 2019 documented a global increase in wave power of 0.4% per year since 1948. A 2023 study in the Journal of Geophysical Research found that extreme wave events have doubled since 1970, the precise period when anthropogenic global warming accelerated. Ocean warming intensifies storm systems by increasing temperature gradients between equatorial and polar regions. Sea level rise compounds every impact with mathematical certainty. California has experienced approximately 22 centimeters of sea level rise since 1900. By 2100, projections suggest extreme wave heights could increase by 5 to 15 percent across the Pacific. Coastal infrastructure engineered for historical conditions will face forces it was never designed to withstand. The shoreline is reshaping itself, and human structures occupy the collision zone. Right now, more than 50 million people reside within 50 miles of the U.S. West Coast. Metropolitan areas like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, and Portland depend on coastal infrastructure, container ports handling 40% of U.S. maritime trade, highways carrying millions of vehicles daily, international airports serving hundreds of millions of passengers annually, water treatment plants and power stations, each one sits within reach of storm-driven swells amplified by rising seas. Climate models from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change agree that warmer ocean temperatures will drive more intense storms and longer period swells. The variability between models is enormous, but the directional trend is unmistakable. The coast is not static. It has never been static. Scientists know that wave energy has increased measurably over the past 75 years. They know that storms are intensifying in both frequency and magnitude. They know that long-period swells are becoming more common across the Pacific Basin. What remains uncertain is the rate at which these changes will accelerate, which specific coastlines will absorb the greatest impacts, and whether adaptation strategies and infrastructure investment can keep pace with nature's mounting force. The wave records being established today may become routine by mid-century. The infrastructure failures witnessed this week may transform from exceptional disasters into monthly occurrences. Can we rebuild faster than the ocean destroys? For now, the swells keep arriving, the buoys keep recording, 
the warnings keep sounding, and the people who live along the edge of the continent face a question with no comfortable answer. How do you protect a coastline when the ocean itself is growing more powerful, more persistent, and more unpredictable with each passing decade?